this feels like a movie, but it's really very like Mike. I watched the movie Tom Cruise, so bless me, baby, Acho. I was I re-listened to that a couple days ago. It's not very good. I, I thought it was better than I remembered, honestly. It's better than I remembered. Uh, oh wait, no, I didn't listen to a. I didn't listen to Thank You. I re-listened the title. I forgot. Oh. Title is T- is a good album. I've decided. I I don't like it anymore. I think it ha- I think it's grown off me. It's a six out of ten, at least. Hmm. I'd be, I'm okay with that. I like. Come on, bang them sticks. Mm-hmm. The dumb, the dumb drummer, sicker than the swine flu. I still like. Um, I like the title track for some reason, and I also still like three a.m. Three a.m. is her best song. It's a good song. It's really good. It. it I, I I kind of I prefer me too honestly. I mean me too. Of, of... Me too is nearly perfect. Um, yeah. Me too. I I also I like what if I. Mm-hmm. And I okay I actually also like Walk of Shame a lot because it's about something that yeah that that young girls will relate to. Who in here can relate? Uh... Oh my god! I put my pants put on my inside pants out. Inside out. Yeah, that uh, that that record means a lot to somebody. I don't. Re- I I think that that that's a fine record for somebody to put a lot of meaning, and I, just, like emotional effort into. You I know? put. I think a good. harsh amount of pure contrarian, like Stan power into Megan Trainer. I'm like I, honestly, it's it's like it's fine. It's it's like a decent thing to do that with. <laughs> Boat Knife is an arts and culture uh, podcast. I'm Patrick Totally. You might know me from posts. I'm uh, Avery Longbottom. You might know me from... <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> uh, you might... You might. I, I'm, I'm Avery. You might know me as Patricia Taxon. I make posts as well. <laughs> You're a famous rhythm heaven YouTuber. Yeah, I. Yeah. That's the, at least the third best game ever made. Is, is rhythm heaven, the one on the Wii. I want to play it now. It's, you've pit, you've pilled me on it. I, I want to play it. Rhythm now. pilled. Yeah. Uh, Pill the best heaven. game is getting over it with Bennett Foddy still, and the second best <laughs> is Marvel it up. Um, we get that we can do um. We're, we're gonna talk. I'm not. We're gonna talk about. Uh, at some point, in the near future, we will talk about Kanye West, "The Life of Pablo," one of the greatest hip hop albums of all time. It's very good. And um, uh, yeah. And or um, the concepts album film music video musical thing by melanie martinez called k12 which is slowly becoming my favorite film ever made <laughs> uh, i want to actually know can we do that first because i'm really excited to hear your thoughts about that okay we're talking about melanie martinez is the wall first yeah <laughs> i i uh i i don't this is my first exposure to Melanie Martinez in any context. Yeah, me too. I didn't of... even. I said I was gonna do my my homework and like actually listen to her first album, which is actually like conceptually. Uh, before yeah, it that one's off. called Crybaby. Right? Yeah, and, and it's about the character Crybaby as a baby who we then see go to school on oh. K twelve. Um, is that why people were getting it mad at her for wearing diapers on my timeline? Okay, I understand now. Because that was literally my only exposure was like people I know like saying she was into like ABDL or whatever. Yeah. Um. So K twelve is a ninety minute softcore age play porno. It's it's very hard to describe K twelve like. If you ask someone, they'll say it's just a bunch of music videos. 
strung together with a threadbare plot. It is a, it is one really mediocre, like, Disney Channel original that begrudgingly had 12 music videos shoved into it. Um, mm -hmm. But it's it's not that. It's so much more confused. Uh, yeah, it's um, it it's structured in a way that's not really a like it's not. I couldn't even really call it like a Disney Channel original movie because it feels like it feels like the album really came first. It's not like it doesn't feel like a like a high school musical where like they wrote like a very bare bones script and just kind of put uh, songs into it. It feels like the song, it feels like the opposite process of writing the songs first and then saying like, uh, and then wanting to make a bunch of connected music videos and then having to, to actually do, do that. that and have people watch it. Yeah. <laughs> I got really scared when they made the bus fly. Yeah. I was, I actually, I think that was like, like a proper means of brain breaking me a decent amount to get me into the, into the, into the, okay. Like, I'll tell you like yeah, like yeah, the headspace yeah, that I was in. Like you don't know this going in, but every song is some combination of like Melanie Martinez singing about herself, mm -hmm. uh, Melanie Martinez barking some political issue at maximum volume, and Crybaby the character existing mm -hmm. in the album's universe, and they're all some of that to some degree it makes sense in the context of it being a lot of music videos because in a music video you'll just have like a separate narrative going within whatever song that they're working with and then a lot of the time they'll be mouthing along to the lyrics which are from very experience like specific life experiences of the presumed artist the image of the artist talking directly to the audience coming through the mouth of a separate character in the world yeah it, ma it so, makes a bit of sense when you get the medium but even more than that uh, the very first song that happens is Wheels on the Bus, and it is the single point where all three sides of this come together, and then the rest is just disparately floundering around trying to do any one of them. Like, it's, a uh, the, the song is called Wheels on the Bus, and it's about Crybaby, the character, driving to school in a bus... Yeah, she's getting sent to school for the first time. Yes. Because she's like... Because she's... All of the characters are played by adults, but they're like... They're they're going to, like, school. And it's like a very big hand gesture of, like, first time going to school. Because it's not really stated if it is kindergarten, if the, if the rules are just different in the universe, the, and it the, doesn't really the, matter that much. The fans talk about it like each song is a different grade, because there's 12 songs. Oh, okay. That's why the period song comes near the end. Okay. Uh, All right. But, but like, the the song it ha it it exemplifies a kind of songwriting that I have been aching for in like mainstream pop music, and that is like gratuitous, squirmy amounts of detail mm. in storytelling. Like it's a, a really deeply uncomfortable track. Uh, it's, it's about, it's about her sitting in the bus and it has this wistful, nostalgic feeling about it. But like the things that she's describing are like very, they seem like they're just passively, quietly like traumatizing her. And then it like hits its home with the, with the idea that no one's watching us. Don't give a fuck wheels on the bus. Uh, so it's like, that's the way things go. The wheels on the bus go round and round and kids get passively traumatized by their surroundings. Uh, yeah, and I, th I, 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 had a, I had a strong negative inverse, like an, in a very strong negative reaction when I first heard this. You have, you, I was sending message to you, just to you while listening to the track. Like, I don't, <laughs> I, I didn't like it. I was scary. Oh. Um, I no 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 I didn't not that I didn't like that not that I didn't like the song itself necessarily but like it was like a very w strange note to start on and the way that like it made me very uncomfortable in spending time in the universe as a whole which I guess which looking at the work as a whole kind of worked to its benefit that it did start out on this very like strong uncomfortable note yeah 
uh, and of just like passively being traumatized and like it got me hyped having... honestly like i was prepared mm. to like this film <laughs> and then they get there and a crybaby talks with her friend like oh i don't know why people are afraid of dying it's just another part of life start in the womb and you end in the tomb and i, I the dialogue is level zero in this film. I hate it so much. It, like every, <laughs> <laughs> and then there, and then there's and then there's a ghost. There's a ghost. Then they walk by a ghost, and the ghost yells at them. <laughs> Why? What? What were the ghosts? I have no idea. Like, there's a lot of things that were probably going to expanded more before there were fucking budget cuts. Like fucking Mrs. Oh Harper. God. <laughs> Mrs. Harper, the, is, the the what like the tr- so, the, one of my fa- one of my favorite nonsense dangling threads on the movie is the sequence where like it cuts to the principal's o- yeah it's the, it's like they they cut to the, the the principal's office and they're just like they have introduced this new character who is a trans woman named Miss Harper who has recently g- come out of the closet. And is like saying, I I am affirming my, my gender identity publicly. And then they're saying, oh, well, we think you're... St-. And then the principal's like all evil. So he's like, I think you're fucking stupid. And then they fire her and she leaves the movie. By queen. the only... By queen. <laughs> <laughs> she exists to... Uh... You said that she's served a bigger role in like an earlier draft. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I, I heard... That's but, just, I yeah. just heard that in fandom mutterings, but... Um, but she does exist in the movie right now yeah. to be introduced and be and be gendered and then get fired from her job. Yeah, very, <laughs> very funny. funny. Um, <laughs> and I mean, technically, it's like it's the the catalyst. Like like uh, Crybaby experiences a mind vision of the trans teacher being fired, and that inspires her to do the song "The Principal," where she talks about the principal. But... I, yeah, like I guess, but also like the her being able to b- blow bubbles has like an emotional arc and is like <laughs> has like I, I guess a not very subtle but like a full setup and payoff and she's just kind of like there for the one time. Yeah. Um. There's a lot of there's a lot of like loose dangling threads. Which, this is a weird one. Again, I have I have I have less of a pro. This is like a it's a it's a format that i haven't seen too much um i know that there are other movies that are essentially long music videos like um uh jacob's been telling me about um a movie that hype williams directed called belly that uh, I, has a lot of like extended music video-esque sequences in it I'm, like uh, i know I really we're gonna talk watch. about kanye west later but i did not watch runaway oh yeah i also didn't watch runaway i didn't listen to dark fantasy honestly i i did oh well it's unfortunately like it's all right but it's from that period in time where every high profile release was just blown the fuck out yeah like, i kind of remember that. and it works on monster i think that's why I yeah like monster. yeah monster is the best track uh but yeah. one of the weirder things in the movie is that there are little parts that are just completely different from everything else in the film structurally mm-hmm. like the second track segueing right into there is class fight and it is the only song that has like movie musical style breaks in the middle like it is isn't the it? only one uh drama club has that one line in the middle before the last mm-hmm. chorus but it's not to the extent of like the structure of class fight where it's verse long dialogue scene verse long dialogue scene yeah yeah and it's and the thing is the song's lyrics are describing the opposite of what's happening on screen, so it doesn't even like make sense as a movie musical style sequence. Because, like it's about like if you listen to just the lyrics, it's uh, it's, it's just Crybaby getting jealous of Kelly having a boyfriend and beating the shit out of her. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the movie, they reframed it. So Kelly is threatens to, to beat up Crybaby at recess, but then she becomes Medusa in self defense. Um, <laughs> and, I do, and it, I do like the way that uh, magical elements are integrated as being just kind of like a thing of like 
I, I do like the magical components in the sense that they introduce um, this notion of being able to, even if they do have infinite power, even if they are do like technically within the text have total control over this universe and have, there's not no problem that it cannot be like solved without like be up beyond just like a, like a big fight scene. It's still oppressive just because of um, it's still an oppressive atmosphere to be in just because they're very young and there's no notion of how these power structures are affecting them. So they're not even really confident for most of the film of what to attack not even even beyond the notion of there being like of them being traumatized without being conscious them being acted on by these power structures as a whole in ways where if they wanted to make them um where if they wanted to make them the, the shit change it's like they don't even know how to how to feasibly change they, it because they're just little kids they were they were planning to just wreck the entire school from minute one to minute done i don't i don't agree they were they... but it didn't i guess but it's like <laughs> It took so long, and if it, we really are approaching it from the notion of it taking that long to do that, it's like the process of maturation. It's not a process of, acqu- of accruing power. It's this process of accruing knowledge over the course of the film, which is kind of fun. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but that's just a theory, uh, as you said. A like, game that theory. Was like a fan theory. A game theory. That was a game theory that kids came up with. Uh, but... But even, like, imagine being me, like, watching this, and the first two tracks in the album being in some way about the character that I'm looking at on screen, uh, like, her as a, like, as a character and what she's experiencing, even if I was a bit confused by Class Fight, like, what it was meant to represent textually, uh, imagine my just abject betrayal when imagine your shark like yes imagine my shark uh when first track three comes along and it's just a thinly veiled trump rant like it's just like she's talking about trump but she doesn't want to get sued so now he's the principal uh and is is like you know like third like third graders do (laughs) yeah uh and then track four is her being mad at her Stan armies, mm-hmm. like, which fi- is a fine grievance to have if you're Melanie Martinez. Uh, if you're not in fourth grade. <laughs> Actually, I do kind of hate that now that you're bringing it up, that notion of like the the main compelling factor being them maturing and and like and like assembling in a progressively higher numbers as it goes on but also like they're just being these tracks that are like that where it feels like it's completely like it, the issue like issues are completely understood and being addressed throughout the record yeah so like, yeah like, i don't cry baby never <sighs> seems like she's confused about anything she, like she's always yeah, the yeah. wisdom bearer uh so i guess that doesn't really work well i was excited for a minute <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, okay, so, and this is another interesting case study. Track five, Nurse's Office, might actually be my favorite song, um, when divorced from the film. Uh, because the lyrics actually paint a very concise and vivid picture that, that again, it's about, it's about the detail and the, like, the specificity more than any, uh, statement shoved into the treetops um that like like the 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 lyrics describe a child who is faking illnesses to to go to the nurse's office but we we discover that the child is doing this to get away from from bullies like can i sit there teach this bitch behind me is cutting my my hair and they said no so i faked up a seizure and left um but we understand that Melanie Martinez is employing some dramatic irony because from the outside, even if the child believes that she is pulling off like a scheme, like she's faking illnesses, she's uh, faking injuries, 
um, we understand that she actually is sick and needs help. Or sick in air quotes. Like, just only mentally. So, like, those who fake illnesses are often themselves truly ill in some different way. Yeah, uh, and yeah. I think that gets to the heart of, like, the message of, like, bullying and, like, the, the passive trauma of growing up in the school system and shit. And, and that being, like, complemented by the visuals of this, like, Where the... really grotesque anim analytical surgery sequence of, uh, not even necessarily graphic, but, but the very, nurse, like, invasive. The, the fucking nurse cuts her hair. This bitch, yeah, like, this, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, bit, this bitch behind me is cutting my hair it was not referring to one of the nurses. <laughs> it means a lot of things. Uh, do, it kind I, of overlap. You're right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do, there's, there's interplay. They had interplay in the music video. Yeah, a bit. Um, as a treat. As a treat. What's it, okay? What is your argument for the music video actually working? Because my point um, was that it's absolutely completely incongruous, and it doesn't make any sense, and actively like distracts from what the the lyrics are saying. I didn't. <laughs> I, I it. I it. My thing is less about content and more so that it makes sense. Um, um, the next net like as an extension of. Of, of a plot with music videos inserted into it for the inverse to be a music video with plot inserted into it which is what this is like it feels like an inverse disney channel movie and it makes sense like formally in terms of that like in terms of like this being a thing that is coherent to consume on that level it makes a lot of sense even as the plot meanders um it's a plot that it, it's a format that allows the plot to meander it uh it it gives um it gives a home to a lot of disparate ideas and i and i think that with a better structure and a plot that would be serviced more by meandering ideas it could be very good it could be very good um i don't know if it's good here i don't i, I don't I, I don't think it's good i think it feels as if someone else who wasn't familiar with the song directed the video um, mm -hmm. because, like, it takes all these really, like, overly literal interpretations of the lyrics. Like, this bitch behind me is cutting my hair, so one of the nurses cuts her hair. Even, even though, like, that's, that wasn't the context of the line. But Melanie Martinez is the writer and director of this film. Um, it feels like it would have been better as, like, a Warrior Cats collective animator project. Like it feels like they would have. Like, I mean, what wouldn't? Le if, I, <laughs> yeah, they should do that with Runaway too. It feels like um, it. It feels like it needed to be blunter than it was at points because it didn't feel interested in doing interplay for most of its runtime. the The parts where where there is interplay like that, it's very interesting and fun. Where it does like. <laughs> where it does what a music video is supposed to do and has like I imagery that complements the songs and songs that complement the imagery to some extent without perfectly overlapping um it, i but mean it doesn't you, really you said like it it, it it you said you'd like it to it be feel... more blunt but there are places where it gets more blunt and it's not good like... yeah i guess that's fair because <laughs> i guess it, yeah i just wish it was something else <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, what did you think of that part where the director says, uh, turn to the first page of the script to see your assigned roles, and Melanie Martinez says, oh, what if we would like to be assigned a different role? Like, something less domestic. <laughs> like, like a like a film director or the president of the United States. Yes. When did this come out? 2019. 2019 damn i thought that i i, I was i was hoping that i was hoping that was like I, I was hoping that was i'm with her stuff that would have been great i mean there's a there's a there's a trump bit in it mm -hmm. so it's absolutely well, I'm at, well, I'm at, well i'm at i wish this was made i think i would like this a lot more if this was made before the 2016 election because i would be able to just like compartmentalize a lot more of it in my head as like 
the blue wave Hillary bullshit, which would have been very funny to me. But, but, but <laughs> as then, is, it's still funny. But then, but then, no, no, no. I, I, yeah, I brought this up while I was watching it too. That was like a few, like twenty minutes after um, the bit of uh, the bit of the trans woman getting fired, and they're like, "Wow, that's such a bad thing that happened." And then twenty minutes later, they're doing like a female brain supremacy bit. Extremely funny. Yeah, Extremely. yeah. Like, they, like they, like she says, like. uh I'm emotionally intelligent. Yeah. I can do things that you can't do. Yeah. Uh, is, uh, our capacity <laughs> to feel emotion is what makes us brainily superior. Uh, word. <laughs> word. Um, uh, <sighs> Melanie, Mar- Melanie Martinez did not say trans rights on K-12. She did not. She, she <laughs> conjured a trans woman to get fired. <laughs> Uh, she is allowed. She 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 is a. Uh, she's rocketing um, some miles towards an incorrect trajectory towards trans rights at a rapid speed, <laughs> and I'm happy for her. She's going so fast. Uh, God. So I want to skip ahead a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, Lunchbox Friends is maybe like instrumentally my favorite track because it's mm-hmm. so saucy like the little mm-hmm. piano and yeah, yeah, yeah. and like it, it's it's going back to like the the sort of over detail that i was sort of that i was enjoying um yeah. but it was it was a very produced record there was a lot of production yes. at every point on the um but fucking if you read between the lines it is just a, it's like a defanged version of uh of show and tell the the angry about stan army's song cuz <laughs> cuz lunchbox friends it it kind of turns around and like it's still demonizing like the fake fans who just want to he say they want to be friends with her but get mad if she smokes a little weed uh but then edifies like you know the the folks who who really wanna who really wanna know her, yeah. and like it's it's just it like it it, uh, it like that's why I say it defangs it like it it because show and tell at least incriminated her entire fan base equally, at, whereas lunchbox friends seems to like be presenting a new way in, like yeah. as long as you're not a fake bitch, you can, mm. you can get it. Yeah, real friends. Real friends. How many of us? <laughs> Somebody stole the laptop that she was fucking bitches on. Had to pay two hundred thousand just to get it from her. Real friends. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, it it feels like a lot. It feels like it's the disparate parts of a lot of it are. I guess not even more interesting. They gesture towards something that could be more interesting than the final product. Yeah. Okay. But also, she's directing a whole less movie thing for the first time did she direct music videos before this i don't know uh i'm gonna i'm gonna check that into i need to fucking talk about orange juice yeah go for it um orange juice is the single most bewildering moment in the film uh (laughs) it's just like hypnotizingly poorly conceived honestly um (laughs) it's 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 the it's the big body positivity moment on the album and it's very explicitly about bulimia. And Melanie mm. Martinez is trying to console a, f- a, a stranger who is vomiting at, at like, b- because of pressure from one of the fake bitches. Uh, her words, not mine. Uh, <laughs> and the 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 metaphor that she chooses to employ is um y- you turn oranges into orange juice enter there and then spit it out of you uh your body isn't perfectly perfect everyone wants what the other one's working no orange juice e yeah yeah o j hey yeah um hey. and this climax is <laughs> You're your fucking cat's mind you. 
Go turn around. The woman's there. Yeah, there she is. Um, yeah, hi. But I should let her out. <laughs> Go get her. Avery's not here right now. Avery, she can't hear me. She's she's opening the door for her cat. I thought a lot of the songs were overproduced. Don't tell her. <laughs> Wait, do you have your headphones on still? I was telling them secrets about. Yeah. I was telling them secrets about T twelve. Okay. Uh, so this this climaxes in a sequence where like Melanie is experiencing visions of this bulimic person's like mind palace uh where the fake bitch is sawing open her head and then putting oranges in it and then the orange juice spills out of her mouth so it's like the <laughs> it is it is the most poorly conceived visual metaphor for anything in existence you know, like i don't think that i don't think that's what bulimia is like yeah it, it's because it doesn't because like bulimia doesn't seem like it's a transformative process in any way but i guess it does I mean, kind of go you do, in as you one do, thing like, come you, out as another you, you do transform food into vomit i guess but there is it's, a, there it's, is a, it's a, a weird it's it was really weird, wasn't? It? I didn't think much about it at the time. I guess because I, I get, again, I was brain broken at that point. <laughs> I, 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 I was just allowing oh, these I, things. To I've watched this film like four times now. What the like, fuck? I, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because uh, like I do continue finding little things that I like about it. Like like it was just recently that I really considered the the lyrics for Nurse's Office. And how it actually like paints a very concise picture, um, and then orange juice put put the oranges in her head, and it kind of, she barfs it. She barf really makes you think. Really, really makes you think. <laughs> really makes you think. Kind of says a lot about society. Kind of says a also, lot about OJ. I've um, <laughs> murder charge like OJ. I saw a lot of. Um, like, I've checked her IMDb. She did do a lot of what they have chosen to call video shorts instead of music videos um, on her page. Also, I've decided that I don't like K-12 because in the process of checking IMDb, I uh, saw that uh, two of the upcoming films were Untitled K-12 Sequel and Untitled K-12 Threequel. Like, but what, what the, are you going to do? What the fuck? I d are, we gonna, are we going to do 13 through 24? Like, what... <laughs> Welcome to <laughs> like what? Like what? What's it gonna be? Melanie Martinez has confirmed that there are two more movies she's, she's writing set in the K twelve universe. She's doing a, a she's wow. doing fucking Jacob Collier. Her what the fuck? Her her second al album project is this multi part conceptual monstrous thing, like. <laughs> The top review on the upcoming K-12 sequel page is just, oh god. <laughs> uh, like, what are they gonna do? Oh, it's on the written by women list. Cool. I mean, Girl, it was. Girls Rock. Was the Cowboy Bebop movie written by a girl? That's cool. Uh, girls Rock. Girls Rock. Uh, our higher capacity to brain yeah. emotions yeah. makes us I love it. I, babe your emotional empathy is so hot <laughs> um and then the film just sputters out like there's I've always forget that detention exists the song mm -hmm. uh cause you know what like I too am brain burned after orange juice mm -hmm. Like that that's the climax of like the tastelessness of everything in that album. Like it, it just and it's all downhill from there. Like we, there's a there's a, a track about statutory rape. She tackles that. Um and it's it's there. It's there's 
There's a this, this this high school's a little bit fucked up. Fucked a up. A bit twisted. Um, fucked up. Fucked up. And then you send your kid to this high school, they're gonna get <laughs> fucked up, okay? <laughs> and then yeah. and then and then a uh, high school sweetheart happens, and it's like a good song. But it also what's it about it's just dear future husband by megan trainer but it is but uh hot topic we're fucked up it's 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 dear future husband by megan trainer wearing an invader zim shirt like yeah it's got it's got like my ter- my neighbor totoro uh in, like handbag like coin purse yeah attack on titan mm-hmm. bitch i'm so sad i can't like just I'm I'm sad that I got into Madoka Magica. I've been thinking about this for a while. I'm sad that I got into like Madoka Magica way after it came out because there was a period of time where I could just get Madoka shirts, and that's that's long gone. Like I miss that wave. It's a, like I have to like go online and get them. It's a really f- fucking good anime. Really fucking good. We could do that for one episode. I do. I, I would be down to rewatch that. That would be like high. Yeah. Quality, but I would love to rewatch that. Yeah, I want to rewatch. Uh... That might give me a good excuse to watch, like, the rebuild films or whatever the fuck they're called. They're not them. good. Don't watch them. I'm just, okay, I won't. Uh, <laughs> Never mind. It's way better as a serial format. You gotta be able to watch the theme song at the start of every episode and have You're the meaning right. of the lyrics slowly change over the course of the series. Oh, I forgot we wouldn't get that. Uh, yeah, okay, fuck that. Until episode 11 just fucks your shit yeah uh fuck your shit fuck your shit um and then the film to to, to madoka magica uh to madoka magica uh that high school is just a normal high school because it's twisted and fucked up <laughs> crazy straws or as i call them straws <laughs> <laughs> i'm the joker joker school <laughs> i went to joker university <laughs> Got my degree in fucking tricks. Uh, but... Uh, then the film just spends 15 minutes or something just do it, like, finishing the story. Mm-hmm. Which is another reason why it doesn't quite work as just a series of music videos with some connective tissue. Yeah. Like... I'll be truthful, I like the dialogue for a lot of the film. I honestly enjoy a lot of the dialogue. Because it's funny. Because <laughs> it's funny. It's funny nothing dialogue. And even if it, like, compromises some of the thematic I like... shit it has going on, it, like, builds up. It builds up. It, like, helps build and develop the aesthetic you, throughout. You hear that? Connecting music videos. You, you hear that? Is it liberty and justice for all? That, <laughs> that, that's bullshit. They did. That's... They did. They did just also invent like like a like a person of color to get sent to the principal's office. Which... <laughs> oh, they, they brought Thank another. You. They, they brought another one back to be your love interest in like the last ten minutes of the film. Thank you, Melanie. <laughs> I love you, Melanie. More like Melanie. Mel. <laughs> Fuck you. Fuck you. I'm cutting that too. Ah. <laughs> Yeah, the last ten minutes kind of just just fall the fuck apart. Oh yeah, there's this thread where like the space lady just comes in oh. through a door. Yeah, that's what I'm kind of saying about like I feel like they were trying to go for a thing of the kids had the power to stop it the whole time and weren't really like knowledgeable of it or able to because she does it, she comes in at the end, but it's not really like a like like, like it's not really like a last moment say like 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 salvation from the bad thing thing like they solve it themselves and they're more equipped to do it for that but i don't really understand how any of the individual lessons that they learned or most of them at least contributed to them they learned something that they went to school and they learned they learned that vaginas have two holes in them very interesting what if you what what, wow i yeah i maybe i like this film so much because I do something exactly like it if I was I, in her place. I knocked over an empty Heineken bottle. Yeah. <laughs> um. I and I hate that which I cannot face within myself. Yeah. It looks too much like you. You hate yeah. it because it looks too much like you. Um. Hmm. You like it because you hate it because it looks too much like you. Yeah. Uh, my favorite song was the one with the judges in it because it had cool Janet Jackson drums uh, deep in the mix, and I like those. 
Like it sounded like like it sounded like if you cut back like half the shit on there, it could be on the, Velvet Rope. There are like cool. actually like several tracks that I like as yeah. music. Um, I I feel like there's like too much at all ends of the mix for me personally. Like I do feel like a lot of them would genuinely be better night chord just so, so that there's like there's too much like. The, the amount of like sonic diversity is a bit overwhelming for me and it feels like it just needs to be compressed a little yeah, bit and shoved you, you, up over you could, the one you corner. could nightcore that entire album oh yeah definitely definitely <coughs> forced sonic diversity okay uh <laughs> do you have any other thoughts about k12 i I, th- I think i just i got out what i wanted to it's yeah a train wreck completely absolutely in all senses i think we're probably gonna see more shit like it which i'm honestly very excited for yeah i feel like if it was good it would be good uh but it wasn't good but it feels like it could be good yeah Um, i I also do just like kind of appreciate the audacity of just releasing the fucking movie on youtube and just having it be on youtube for free like the whole thing just ready to go out of the box. Yeah, so those so those synchronized swimmer scenes can get like compressed the, the fuck out. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, those didn't look too good when I won. No, they did because I put them in 1080. I clicked it good. I did a good job clicking, so I didn't mind. But yeah, that's going to look like shit on 95% of people's screens. I did like the synchronized swimmer sequence. I yeah, actually I like quite nice. enjoy how most of the film looks because I am yeah. a bitch who lives for vibes and there are vibes to be found. Um, I kind of don't like that style of color grading a lot usually, but it was used pretty well here. Yeah, it's it's got like Chainsmokers ass music video co- like That's color it. grading. Yeah, but yeah. it's used to effects because like it's pastel, but like dull ass pastel with you know... with heightened darks and lowered lights you know a frightening amount about bro step edm aesthetics or just like bro edm aesthetics like stadium edm or whatever yeah uh a it's... V, like a, 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 a v, i or whatever a viki i a v, a v. <laughs> i i listen to a lot of bro edm it's a side of me that i don't think people appreciate enough uh it's I don't know if he's listening to this, but the wonky angle is like the only critic with the necessary faculty to talk about half my work. Mm-hmm. Uh, love you. Is he the is he the one who's familiar with the like he, the EDM shit? Oh, yeah. yeah, he did that. One. I remember that one. Yeah, he, he has a yeah. he has a lisp. He's a yeah, a bit yeah, scruffy. Yeah, that king. Yeah, that king. Okay, gotcha. Um, okay, thank you, wonky angle. Thank you, wonky angle. I'm going to refill my water, and we're going to talk about Wake Up Mr. West. Wake Up Mr. West. Big booty beats for you! <laughs> All right, you start. Okay. This is your idea. Now, this was my idea. Now, for our second disparate media property of the day, we're going to be talking about The Life of Pablo by Kanye West. It's such a good album. 20... Really fucking good. I've, I've, I've been spiraling deeply in love with this record over the last like year or so of my life specifically it's maybe the best album probably not but it's really good really really fucking good i it's a strong eight i I think it i think it might be perfect i i can't really think of changing anything about it which is ironic considering that's the life of pablo but (laughs) delete delete saint pablo you don't need it I'm even torn on that at this point. Okay, let me start with um note about Kanye West and his broader discography. I think that the way that people that a lot of people approach his discography is rather flawed. Um the notion of old Kanye and new Kanye is very well documented and I think that is a very real thing. Um and uh, like there is like a very strong aesthetic divide between dark twisted fantasy and Jesus that is addressed within the content of the lps too i thought um, old Can- kanye was just the bears i'm not sure what 808s and dark twisted would be but i consider it separate from new that's kanye. that's that's old new kanye yeah medium kanye 
808s, I wish that it held up better than it does. What? Okay, but off track already. But sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. You're fine. You're fine. I'm. Just, there's a lot to talk about. Um, I think that the way that people think about the the post the the new Kanye record specifically is strange, in the sense that there is like. Okay, let me talk about rate your music a little bit. So if you went on to rate your music. Kanye West and go to Kanye West page you can see the ratings begin like form you could find a credible emotional arc in the ratings of the record themselves like you see oh there's a dip oh it rises again oh there's a dip and that's very compelling to look at from a distance and say like wow these are very big this is an artist who has gone through a lot with their art and it's been very transformed and uh and you and you could see these very definite slopes in the art in the quality of their art and their attempts of their art over these like different periods of time throughout their career. Um, I think this is dangerous. I think that being able to go on a website and being able to view these as a definite arc is very damaging to to like discussing these records as a whole because we can look at yay. And say like, wow, that's a big step down from Pablo, um, when because it's in the same category of album because it's listed as one of the albums on this thing and it's part of a downward arc. But I feel like it's hard to address Yay as anything because it's part of a broader project. Yay is not Yay on its own. Yay is part of like this whole cycle of records that were these micro albums that were being released like. Within the original context of its release, it's part of this broader album cycle. It was part of this broader album cycle with the Ye record, uh, the Nas record, the Kids See Ghosts record, um, the um, um, the Pusha T record, and Tania Taylor's KTSC, which all formed this kind of like cohesive... All of these things were released originally around the same time within this specific context and were all meant to support each other. There are all these different there are all these different approaches and sounds that within the content of this original release express this like sudden burst of new content, this like whole like m menage of different styles. It's this beautiful it's this beautiful cycle as a whole. And Ye feels kind of incomplete on its own. It really does. Um, as a record, it feels like something that doesn't really build enough to justify a lot of the, like, very... It doesn't build enough to justify the end of Ghost Town. It doesn't build enough to have this repeating chorus playing out into the void. Um, it doesn't build enough to have this thing that... To have a contained emotional arc within itself... But if we consider it as a part at the end or near the end of a broader series of album cycles, it makes a lot more sense. It, was the first it makes one. a lot more. Was it the first one? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's still <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> fuck me then. But it still is being reinforced by other records surrounding it. I'm gonna, There's still other shit there. I'm gonna listen to all of those. You've convinced yeah. me. It 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 seems it's it's like. This is a very broad, overarching process, but my central point here is that taking Ye on its own, it's not as good as The Life of Pablo, but we can't say that it's a step down because it's part of a separate project, even though it's all listed as an album on, on one page. Like, it's hard to consider there to be, like, a direct... I could, like, visualize, I, okay. like, an arc from Yeezus to The Life of Pablo, but I can't really, like... I, I don't like the notion of I, from Pablo towards Jesus as King, there being this incremental downward arc. And I just treat Jesus as King as being like an abomination <laughs> that just kind of happens. Like, I can't see it as an arc of part of anything else, you know? Um, so I, ha I have a similar feeling. I think that the internet's tendency to like narrative advise narrativize a artist's work is mm -hmm. or like give them a narrative in favor of their work or in favor against their work um like fucking that asshole pinkest pink guy <laughs> ass fuck ass fuck drama ass. queen 
like like taking like like taking an artist at, like as with as much of a respected background and history as Anish Kapoor and like purposefully fanning a petty pointless artist drama because you didn't get to use the death black material that kills you um it <laughs> like the funny color that makes you die if you look at it yeah uh and doing that and basically can like erasing this guy's work and legacy in the eyes of basically the entirety of tumblr like i think that's that should be punishable by death i don't care who yeah, you are yeah no put, like, put it yeah yeah put a sentence them to hard labor immediately no questions yeah like <laughs> it's very frustrating especially with living artists because like after jesus is king Kanye's going to drop like a really good record and everyone's going to say like wow this is an incredible comeback even though like Jesus is King has very separate aesthetic, thematic, and like content goals than pretty much anything else he's released. It's <laughs> just it's it's like completely set. It, it it's this thing where it's like sometimes it's invited. Sometimes I can't deny with Kanye more than most artists it's invited. Like we can draw a lot out of Jesus being released after Dark Twisted Fantasy, you, you can... but we can't draw that same amount of content out of Jesus is King being released after life of Pablo. You can draw a and that's lot like, from... that, that's a, that's a dangerous tendency. It's really dangerous yeah. when you're approaching it. But even like when they're not alive, like fucking, okay. Y'all know Marvin Gaye, legendary yes. singer song songwriter. Um, and like his family institution sued Robin Thicke for uh blurred lines and they won that case um and those fuckers over at the axis of awesome actually made like a parody track of got to give it up called got to rip it off and it was like this taunting jeering thing about how like oh this song is technically fair use so we're the guys that you can't sue even though we are the ones that actually ripped you off and like, who the fuck are you? It's I, Marvin Gaye. It's Marvin like Gaye. What? <laughs> like, like, what are you doing? He's like, not here. He's not you here. <laughs> he's not like, in the room. And, and who like, are you the, fucking talking to? Like, and it's directed at Marvin Gaye as well. Yeah. So like, like you know, they yeah, just like, fuck you, like Marvin. Some, Your parents suck shit. Like, like some some fucking white assholes who have contributed nothing to music except for the four <laughs> chords of pop being codified. <laughs> Which, yeah. you know what, honestly, we could have done without that. Uh, <laughs> God, I'm just like, getting mad. I'm just getting mad looking at Kanye's regular music now. Gold Digger is not bolded. Excuse me? There is no reason for Gold Digger to not be bolded. It has a 3.49. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> don't don't oh. get too mad about Rate Your Music. They think Foley I, Artist is my best album. It's not. I, Foley Artist is good. It's really not your best album. Oh, well. <laughs> but I, I, I don't want to, like... I don't want this to be, like, me saying, ah, oh, fuck, you rate your music. I feel like it goes into, like, broader tendencies towards... Bio, putting a bio, Grafting a biography onto artists when there one really isn't necessary. Like, I've been thinking about it in the context of Nick Drake a lot recently. Um the folk musician guy and a lot of like people who I've seen look over his discography um, and try and find, let me make sure I'm still recording and try and find a lot of um, like meaning in his discography as a whole, essentially present his discography and his pr progress as an artist as like inevitable, as just essentially inevitably building up towards a suicide as pink and treating like, pink moon which is this beautiful record that contains a lot of multitudes within it as just kind of being this like very half-hearted suicide note that really only holds value as a suicide note and everything up to that being built up for that it it, it, it there's just yeah R River there's just Man a lot is of too good a song to be that it's like, too it's too good of it's too good of a song to be in service and, of a narrative like that you know and, and um 
I'm gonna like do dil- diligence. The the axis of awesome Marvin Gaye observation was given to me by a guy who is on YouTube as Car K A R. Mm. He's my dad. Um, Thanks, Car. Yeah, uh, he he he's he does radically leftist vlogs, and he's cool. So, um, and it's... he he got me bitterly angry about. Marvin Gaye and the Axis of Awesome. So I am also mad about that uh, now because, like, we because the copyright the the copyright disputes with that song are bullshit. But they're completely separate from Marvin Gaye as a person and as a musician. Yeah, like it's just like that's music industry bullshit. That's grafting and, the narrative and, and of like, the broader music industry onto the this narrative. onto a dead dude who did and who is whose who, music is still like very pertinent. Whose it's, music uh, was fucking appropriated by white shitters yeah at, at all times yeah uh and like appropriation is a very different discussion than ip i think uh because mm-hmm. and it's useless to invoke ip in discussions of cultural appropriation it's it's uh in fact like counterproductive like, it's a misnomer. It's a misnomer. It makes you play. Things... Into, it makes you play into the hands of capitalist power structures when you immediately do that. It's there are helpful. things that should be in the public domain that nonetheless can be appropriated. Like fucking, I think black convict singing should be in the public domain. Like no oh one should. No one should God, own that. Don't we can't. <laughs> we but, can't start on the we can't, Palestine. But but fucking, what's what's his what's his fucking name? The Caravan Palace should not yeah. be sampling Rosie in their yeah. fucking garbage, shitty, furry electro swing. Like, Fun fact about Lone Digger: it does sample real slave songs, and that's the and that's the chanting that's deep in the mix of the pre-chorus. It's not. It's not. It's, it's not, real. It's, not it's deep, real field it's, it's recordings. One of the, it's one of the fucking vocal chops. It's. Oh. It's really. They could have gotten anything. I like, fucking hate art. I hate art so much. Fuck, <laughs> Jesus! So you were talking we're, about we're get, your music, okay? Bo- yeah, Boat we're knife going is an arts a bit. Culture podcast. Boat knife is an arts and culture podcast. We're going a bit. I I went. I drove this a bit off the rails, but I did just kind of want to make the broader point before diving further into life of Pablo as an album specifically. That framing the life of Pablo as a specific point in a broader narrative right now is dangerous and unhelpful, especially. Uh, especially as Kanye has made his mental health something that is very prominent in his art, especially as we, if, if we make this into like a, like essentially the people who are saying like the notion that Jesus is King is like part of a downward arc as an artist is like d- just based on this visualization alone is just like, it feels like it, it just feels like it's very infantilizing towards the mental illness that he is trying to confront very directly in his music. And is trying to be very honest about in his music, um, but Ye still is just kind of like okay. On okay, its own. like I actually had this happen. Mm. Okay, I'm sorry, Mark. I love you, but your review of Little Spoon was kind of ass. Oh. Like I, I, it's it's okay that you didn't like it, but like he made this. He he. He brought it. He brought it in to make it like a part of the narrative of Patricia Taxon's lackluster second half of 2018 like oh yeah i remember that shit yeah at like like where where he put like telecommunications majesty and two tone on like a downward arc and now little spoon was me like trying to get back my old fans who like my cutesy electro pop stuff and like the which sp- are which the- are all tracks that which are all albums that are completely like in content and in like everything in concept everything completely different from each other different in content and also when i was fucking working on them as well like yeah and uh also all of this is within the span of like five months yeah also <laughs> It, you, and also you're like also you were like 20 yeah <laughs> no i was i was 18 oh I, shit yeah you were ba- you were super baby then yeah a uh, little spoon was 20 2018 christmas mm-hmm. yeah i remember that fuck that was a good time 
uh, Christmas. But I get what you mean about rate your music kind of fostering this exact yeah. sort of. No, I don't even think it's rate your music is like a good a, a, like amalgamation of it, but I feel like it's a broader cultural tendency to immediately want to graft a narrative onto a body of work as if that's going to fucking help anybody, especially for an artist that is still like, uh, like, like an artist that is still active and very much so in the public eye, if now more than ever. Uh, But I want to, I want all this to say that I think that uh, so that I can say without like, with, I can say that Jesus is King is ass without it affecting any of my sentiment relating to Pablo. That being said, I did listen to Jesus is King for the first time since it came out in full um, as, as a preparation for uh, this podcast. And it's really fucking bad. It's really, really fucking bad. The Pierre Bourne tag at the end of On God was like a jump scare. I screamed in my car. <laughs> I forgot I was there. I forgot that Pierre what I forgot that Pierre did come out here. Reuniting clips to do two ass verses that take up combined, like each of those individual verses are given less breathing room than Kenny G playing unaccompanied into the void immediately <laughs> after the second verse. What the fuck are you so, doing? So, so Use this that... gospel makes me so mad because there is a good version of that that got leaked that exists and he chose to release a bad version. Is is that is that a car noise or is that like a Wurlitzer pressing <laughs> one button over and over again? Like like an, I think it sounded I... like either like it was actually recorded in a car or it was an electric piano. Yeah, Water's the only track I like, and it's only because of the production. I probably would like Follow God if the verse was better, but it just kind of trails off at the end. This feels like a movie, but it's really very like Mike. Okay, Life of Pablo. Um, <laughs> Life of Pablo is a good record. I, I think I think I I I I um I think that I started this. I came in very hot onto this one, I guess. But Life of Pablo is like. A very exciting for record for me for a lot of reasons. Um, yeah, we could start with the um, we could start with Saint Pablo, I guess. Um, I've been trying to um, okay, well, I guess to future proof this. There is a one a very big important aspect of Life of Pablo um, is that as it was being released, it was kind of being updated and tweaked. Um, there's very long logs you could find online documenting all the changes that were made to different versions of the life of Pablo. And it uh, exclusively music, got better. Like, yeah, it it did. Except for the version of Wolves that made it worse, which is funny, so it's fine. But <laughs> um, Rate Your Music actually has them documented pretty well, so fuck Rate Your Music. But also they did a good job of archiving all of those separate ones um, with credits and everything. Um, one of the changes that's... Um, kind of con- been confounding me for a while is um originally it the last track on the record if you go onto spotify right now the last track on the record is a song called saint pablo um but originally it ended uh the track before with a uh, fade which i've been trying to i've been trying to think of I, i've been thinking about that for a while because that's really the only track that was added in wholesale at the end of the record um a and lot it's, of people it's a, said it's a, that Fade was weird as a closer because it's just this kind of swanky, like, down-tempo boomf boomf that yeah, ends with it, this sort of empty, void-like collage of samples. Yeah, it starts uh, out as um, building a feed, like a beat out of this one um, Mr. Finger sam- sample, this, like, very... First of all, sampling Mr. Fingers on its own is like a very big, broad stroke, and like speaks towards like the under like like <laughs> white music critic talking about like 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 individual town's pride, but it does like go back to like his musical background. There's like a lot of like a re- reference, like it, it it harkens back to the beginning of the album in the subtle way of like that album incorporated Chance the Rapper, and now this is incorporating Mr. Fingers as, like, being I, part of, like, the same geographic center. And there is resolution to that. I, I'm in, like, always, a quiet like, surprised. Way, but it's, but it, I'm always surprised by, like, how huge Chance the Rapper's verse is on Ultralight Beam. It's good. It's, I, I, I like, do, it, it, like, I, it always kind of stops me good. in my tracks. Like, 
Yeah. Ultralight Beam is a song that is it's kind of remarkable in a way due to how like minute Kanye's presence on it is like that really is like a chance song more than anything else. Um and Kanye like like Kanye is producing a lot of that track from what I understand, but like um it's like it's a note that starts the album on a note that's not really odd. I think it sets like a very strong thematic center, but it's something that even though it's harkened back to in Fade does kind of pitter out. Um, and then as the album was being updated uh, and altered on streaming services, this new track appeared called St. Pablo that is kind of like, I guess it's kind of, it's, it feels more like a direct conclusion. It feels a lot more like a f traditional final song like on the record. show-stopping number right at the end, which to me, it felt like you were, like it was wrenching it back out of the grave. Like the, mm. the album had been slowing down. Yeah. Like Waves is right in the middle and that's like the end of act one. Yeah. And then, and then like, like it, it goes into like FML and Real Friends and Wolves which are like the the dark moody tracks and then it sort of that transitions into more mechanical repetitive tracks that fucking go on forever like 30 yeah. hours and no parties in LA yeah like the no more parties in LA beat i'm pretty sure mad lib like literally made that on an ipad and it's the best beat of all time ever made but <laughs> it is like very distinct from like the it, it feels very distinct from like it, it feels very distinct from the production style of real friends without feeling out of place on the record i think 30 hours kind of bridges the gap on there oh also i guess that frank's track was also technically added in but that's just kind of like that's that's because he felt bad about taking out frank ocean and replacing him with i think it's rihanna mm. <laughs> uh, that's fair oh also did did you know that the lady who goes ooh wow ooh, wow ooh, on wolves is actually like a really <laughs> like accomplished vocal arranger in her own right? She uh, oh I think you mentioned her yeah that's, yeah yeah that's that's Carolyn Shaw I might be wrong on that but gotcha she made a little piece for eight voices called partition for eight voices I think it's called. Um, and it's good. That's if you if you ever hear someone say like, to the side, Alamand left shit, then it's that. Mm. Gotcha. Because uh, there's a lot of weird spoken word stuff on it that makes me happy. Um, shit. Yeah. Shout out to her. Shout out to her. You did a good job on that. The song that I've heard. And part Partisha. Partisha for eight voices. That's Hell yeah. That's almost my name. <laughs> Partitia, Partitia tracks. So. No, part, partita. Partita. Part, partita for Eight Voices by Carolyn Shaw. It's a good good piece. Um, My fun fact about that stretch of the record is that um, Chan, Chance the Rapper is, um, I, I guess he's more like he, he has, we could credit him for more than just his, like, like the ultralight beam thing because um, he was essentially on a, in a fight with Kanye for a full week relating to the track list of the record begging kanye to keep waves in kanye was originally going to cut waves and chance had to like talk him down for a full week to keep waves in which is really really important and i thank chance immensely for going through the work with that because mm. that because that is important it that, is a like, good that, track really I like, good track. i like it as an end of act one track mm -hmm. i hate that chris brown makes me ascend Oh yeah. I... Also, fuck, fuck, <laughs> fuck, Chris Brown. Suck my dick, Chris Brown. Die, bitch. But I mean, I can't say die. But, <laughs> but, yeah, it's an important track for the record as a whole. I think that the fluctuation between Fade and Saint Pablo is emblematic of two divergent threads within the record. One is to have, like, the formal qualities of the record be very barren in benefit of the content of the record, which we see in Fade right at the end and throughout the track itself. Um, and the other would be St. Pablo as a tendency to kind of wish to create symmetry within that record. There's a lot of, like, little bits of symmetry throughout the track listing that are, like, very prominent and very intense and do... For as much as the record is known for being a record that is like kind of shuffled around and meshed together in a lot of like ways that can seem very confusing on first listen, 
it is this thing where there there is like very intricate patterning to the way that it's arranged i think um, that like saint that, pablo that... is a much more of like a direct mirror to ultralight beam in like the same way that we get like the two verses on no more parties in la or the way that we get the two like intermission tracks with Sil- with the silver surfer and frank's track or even like the way that like I... There's a lot of instances like that. I think that conception. And it's two separate. Yeah. That conception of the album being scattershot and just like thrown together. I think that has lessened over time as the like the mixing has been improved over like Mm. over time. Yeah, I'm a fix wolves. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a fix wolves, and and the mixing is like actually like damn. After listening to 808s and (laughs) and uh, and. Uh, my beautiful dark twisted fantasy, like some of the most just garbage produced albums <laughs> in his entire, like those, like stick with me now. Those albums are gonna age so poorly. They are gonna sound like late two thousands loudness war garbage very soon. Yeah. And like the the bear albums are better produced than eight oh eight. Absolutely. And... I was surprised by how pr- well produced late registration was. Honestly, when I checked it out for like, also for the purposes of this, because I had only heard eight oh eights before then. It yeah. just kind of sounded like, well, blown out. It sounded really blown out, and I don't know, I don't know, I don't know why. Kanye I have no was, idea. I don't know how... why. Ka- I don't. I don't know why Kanye keeps allowing Rick Rubin to go near him. I don't know why I, it keeps happening. I don't know how you let Love Lockdown get past <laughs> any any anyone. Uh, like that song, it's so fucked. We must remember that this was the age of like of the iPod. It, it was when this everyone was, was listening to this shit through earbuds. That it, that were $2. it was it was the age of death magnetic. Also, like, <laughs> also that <laughs> Saint. I I don't think there's a single sound that's funnier to me than the Saint Anger snare. I know it's a really <laughs> easy choice, but it's so fucking funny. It's <laughs> don't. Donk. <laughs> you're getting it's a it's a whole record of bonks you're getting bonks they the whole predicted record. sophie yeah <laughs> My fa- <laughs> rest in peace rest in peace jesus is going to age like way fucking better than dark twisted fantasy yeah like it's still, the, it's still distorted but it's doing something with that yeah it's like, like when the blown the fuck out but every in, like, time a really cool way. every time a sample comes in on that album i I I've tense up because it's like so much. Yeah, on Bound Two, when the when the loop cuts out and it just for people who have only seen the music video of Bound Two, which 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 the, the retro. The, oh yeah, the, like it inserts yeah. it inserts the chorus before the song starts. Yeah, for, for those who have not only seen the music video version of Bound Two, for mo for like halfway through the song, it's like the beat is just the sample. And, like, it's after this whole record of content. So when you get this thing that feels like it's starting to resolve and end on kind of a downbeat, and it just fucking explodes in this whoosh of shit, it's so much. It's so overwhelming. Bound to I love Bound to It's might, so good. Might be the best album closer ever. It's really good. Like I can that, say, for, at the very least, that On Sight is the best opening second of an album of all time. Like, like <laughs> I'm thinking, like, what, what are my favorite album closers? I gotta, I gotta look. Mm-hmm. Like God, it just it just makes so much sense. Okay, like recently I just I recently re-listened to Burned Mind by Wolf Eyes, which is a pretty starkly different album, but it's it's a noise album. Uh but it's mm-hmm. got a bit it's more like it's a bit more like it's a bit grindcore like with harsh screamy vocals, but it's got like modular synth blasts of noise and lots of feedback. I haven't but, listened to much Wolf Eyes because they made a post that annoyed me at one point. Sorry. <laughs> I think one of the guys runs an Instagram meme page or something. But good for him. Uh, the last track, what's it called? Not counting the hidden track because I was like too fatigued to listen to the hidden track. Uh, Black vomit. Black vomit just fucks you up. Like the, the whole album's at ten and then they turn it to eleven. I like that closer a lot. Gotcha. Uh, so I, that's the I, last. I'll check it out. That's the last album closer that I remember. So, so it's one of those two. Yeah. It's either Bound 2 or that 12-minute voice track. Black, it's eight minutes. Uh, <laughs> I was, damn. Spotify no longer lists I Am A God as featuring God, which is unfortunate. Yes, I hate that. 
hate that. Wait, Bring shit. She wanted to leave from the mollusk. Oh, yeah. That, okay. That's, that, that's, yeah, that's yeah, also that's, in the running. That's the, the, the that is probably better than bound to, but it's yeah. difficult. It's, it's, diffi- it's it, a it very hard my, choice. It, bre- it breaks my heart to say it, but that one might be better. It she wanted be better. to leave. She wanted to leave is the only song that like consistently makes me almost weep whenever I listen to it. And I don't even really know why still. Okay. We can, we'll talk about the mollusk another episode. Yeah. <laughs> I think no more parties in LA is my favorite track on Pablo but I, but as I've expressed to you several times, my favorite moment of the record comes on Freestyle 4. Uh, designer, we, we talked about Chance, but I would like to propose that Designer is the secret MVP of the record. Um, I like how they both just sample one of his songs in its entirety and then also <laughs> let him feature. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's, it's, it's like a really, it's a, it's a really, like in which the content complements like the formal qualities of the record perfectly of just taking this other song wholesale and freestyling over it as part of a sound collage and then later in the record bringing the guy in to do the best to do the best fucking like ride out on the entire record my part i want to pinpoint the exact point for them first my favorite point on the record is on freestyle for when Kanye's like winding up for for the for the drop on that track, and right before Designer comes in, he does this. Hey, hey, I want it right now. All of them niggas just get it shot. And then he goes into his verse, and it's so cute. It's so cute, and it's so exciting, and it like really I overwhelms can't, okay, me every you know time what? I listen to it. I can't believe. I don't think I will ever forgive the rap critic for convincing me that Panda is a bad song back in 2016. Uh-huh. Oh, Panda is so good. Right. It's such a good song. It's such a good song. I w- I was blind. He's blind, for mm. one. <laughs> like, I. But I get it now. I, Panda is such a Panda is such a massive track. Like it feels. Did, like, did I tell you that exactly like, as big as it's trying to be? I, yep. I think I told you that. Like I finally got trap rap when I heard Jeffrey by young thug yeah 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 you were yeah you've mentioned that, that which is also so a very good, good record incredible so good. good have you heard slime, uh, slime season three i yet? have not for shame fuck oh my god <laughs> dripping i have i played i have i played dripping you for you at least at some point where he just like goes nuts near the end that's dripping okay. that's dripping <laughs> that's my favorite young thug song where he, where the entire like <laughs> second verse is is full full energy full screaming so exciting so fucking good that song makes me so excited uh <laughs> it, it that that track feels massive and i want to kiss so, i want to kiss and marry whoever put the hi hat fills in on that track you're beautiful it was probably london on the track i'll marry you i think I'm surprised every time I re-listen to the life of Pablo, I was surprised at this. Like every single time, I vibed with highlights slightly more. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Tell me about I, highlights. I want to hear your thoughts on that. highlights. Is my favorite song. Mm-hmm. Like it just it feels like every second, it's going somewhere else, and it has like the piecemeal, chaotic, world building ass like structure, but condensed into one song. Where it feels like, I wish my dick had a GoPro. Uh, and it's it's just filled with shit like that all all the time, yeah. uh, but then it has that that one like huge ass synth hit in the middle uh. out of nowhere like one the get the food of Islam in the trenches huh even though they know Jesus is a Christian huh we're, we're, that one we're, 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 that's such that a part. yeah yeah uh, I even kind of got used to the to the snap yeah you were complaining about the snaps too. Which is fair. They are strange snaps. That is some a, a, a choice. The compressed reverb is very intense. Yeah, mm-hmm. but compressed, gated. But uh, other than that, I am a normie, and I like waves and ultralight beam Those a are, lot. It's good. It's good. There's not really like a bad choice for favorite track, honestly. Like, there's ones that I like. But I really like that the way that low lights and highlights works together. <laughs> that's like lights is so good it's it's my favorite like semi intermission because there's not really skit tracks did, did you like, hear this did you hear the the song that that sample is from oh uh, no which one is it the, the, it's a monologue it's on like a house track oh shit it's, 
that's fucking you wanna dope. You want to hear a testimonial about my life? And he's like saying that over like a, a pounding like retro house beat. And that makes it and that makes it and that makes it work with fade better too. That's fucking Jesus Christ! Oh my God! Ah, I love this record. It's so good. <laughs> so good. It's it's his best album. It's may maybe honest honestly in the process of like researching, well researching as in listening to a bunch of music, but researching as in like listening to the records again i do i forgot how good yeezus was but i think that i'm going to like pablo more eventually like yeezus i forgot I, it's been a while since um, yeah yeezus yeezus holds up yeah yeezus is really fucking good um it's very nice of kanye to create a song of, of kanye and mad lib and everybody involved to create a song that conveniently has both the best kendrick lamar verse and the best kanye west verse on the same song so that jesus, if you... <laughs> jesus is better than the money store i but elaborate but not as good not not as not as good as <laughs> bottomless pet what the fuck are you... <laughs> i i i i still honestly don't get like Jesus being worked into the notion, worked into like, I don't know what experimental hip hop is. I'm going to say yeah, that. Yeah, me neither. That's another, that, okay, this is a very rate your music specific thing, but I feel like experimental hip hop doesn't mean anything. I don't know what the through line is between like recent Earl Sweatshirt and Death Grips and fucking clipping is. Like, it just kind of feels like a place to shove all like, all, all, all weird black art and all art that is derivative of weird black art and just kind of like putting it there i guess it doesn't ma- mean anything experimental hip- is a fucking good album experimental hip-hop means people, people nothing overlook to me. that mid city is a good record but i don't know how it fits like it's ge- as a genre in a ge- in geographical terms and anything terms i'm looking at the chart right now fucking viper is on this chart like what do you mean I okay. I am not fucking game for Viper revisionism. Not, like, yeah, I will not. not like I will it. not stand. Like, this is th- okay. You know what? That's what I'm there's saying. It's just a place where like black art that people think is weird is put. Uh, that's why I don't like there, it. There, there's a there's a thing that internet music people do that I hate, where like whenever some artist gets big, um doing something that is intentionally a bit skeenshy uh and rough around the edges like 100 gex comes out and suddenly like digital distortion is cool again Mm -hmm. uh and then some fucker says like oh you remember fucking my teenage dream ended she was doing 100 gex before 100 gex like just it doesn't mean that when someone does something that is purposefully sounds amateur is that anyone who didn't know what they were doing was ahead of the curve. Like, yeah, I think that uh, like, that's more done in directly in jest, but like, I have seen some people like try, I think the, the notions of outsider art and experimental hip hop are dangerous for similar reasons. Like it feels like a place where art is put when nobody wants to deal with it. I don't, like, I, yeah. Because um, I it took me a long time to wrangle with this, but 100 Gex is a fucking well produced album. It's good. It's a really good it, record. Like when it, I hate it. Um, <laughs> but okay. It 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 is a well mixed album. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't get stuff that sounds like that if you just let it peak and don't do anything else to it. Uh, it's not just thoughtless. It is a engineered album they had a really specific aesthetic that they were going for with it yeah and they got uh, and they and... achieved it they did what they wanted to do with it yeah and the only good song is stupid horse okay uh, well <laughs> well that's your thing you're saying that <laughs> you're saying those things about it and this is why this is why pad jennington is a net negative to society yeah. because he, he treats like unpleasant art or like outsider art whatever that is, as, like, a fucking tourist destination. He talks about... I fucking hate the way he talks about Pulse Demon. He Ugh. he treats it like it might as well just be any Harsh Noise album. Like, oh, it's such a... It really... It's such a palate cleanser. It makes you appreciate any music that you listen to after it. 
it's like, just it, it's, the, the process it's a, of being un, unanalytical towards noise music in that capacity as an introduction to introducing the genre and then simultaneously treating it as a homogenous being is like doing a great disservice to like Mersbaugh really is doing in like but people he's doing interesting stuff he's doing like, interesting Paul, stuff Paul he's Steven. interesting within and within the noise field at least he like i haven't listened and to Paul much Steven of his yeah, yeah, has yeah. individuality within his uh mm-hmm. within his discography like it's um it's one of the loudest mastered albums but it's also one of the barest it, like it because venerology venereology whatever however yeah. you pronounce the it funny, that was funny like, funny purple man funny purple man he went through that multiple times and layered noise on top of it multiple times as he went through but um pulse demon is one improvisational session you can beginning to end i've seen lists that people have like been able to recognize samples from it even like you've been able to id samples that were sourced for that record um and i know this because one of them was a jim o'rourke free improv record and i found an ls based on that but it's like there are specific aesthetic goals in mind. It's not just, I'm going to make a, a loud... There are some noise artists that do just kind of like want to make a series of loud noise walls for different moods, um, which, is, which is a genre called harsh noise wall. And even then there's diversity within that. But the notion of like... In, of introducing it and then immediately compartmentalizing it as being emblematic of the whole genre, when really it's doing like... Thing, when really it has very specific aesthetic goals in mind within that genre. Like, Mersbau is an artist who, at least for the first part of his career, I haven't listened to a lot of his more digital stuff. Um, for the first part of his career, he was always approaching noise rock from the, or uh, harsh noise from the angle of a uh, psychedelic rock to some extent. There was always a psychedelic uh, angle to it. There was always yeah. this. Uh, there was always this element of like, and you can hear when he starts bringing other genres in. Yes, like, uh, like venerology was specifically more punk inspired. I forget, than, like metal. I forget uh, what album it was uh, specifically, but there's one album with a funny circle on the cover that I listened to that did feel like a gesture towards like a like a down tempo record. Open. No, Door no, no. Open. It was a, it was a different one, I think. Okay. Um, but it, it's like they all have like. There and there's some records that are just like terror modules. Like Dharma is a very terrifying record among among his discography because it is just like that is a record that is very cold and unloving and uncaring uh, within that body of and, work. And you have records that are very like there's records they're, they're that are very, like they, they, like on the other hand there's hybrid noise bloom, which is a lush and gorgeous yeah uh, landscape of noise yeah. Um, I recently but, uh, checked out what. Wait, Laz, I want to do one more example for Mercy okay. because I, um, I did want to bring up uh, an underrated hit that I found recently, which is a, a record called "Hard Love and Man," which is uh, a record that was made out of samples of one Deep Purple song, I believe, called "Hard Love and Man." <laughs> and on top of it being like, again, leaning towards like the more noise rock direction of having like a very specific aesthetic tendency it's like it's a funny record it's a funny record to listen to more so than most of the ones in his discography because it's coming from this kind of like jokey it's it's coming from this jokey kind of intentionally like faux machismo like it's coming from a place that's intrinsically going to form this kind of ironic bubble around it that makes it more enjoyable to live listen to there's even want, within his discography, there's like multitudes within it. I want to talk about in a video sometime in the future about the ways, like the several different ways in which other genres have influenced noise musicians mm-hmm. and how this has really so, like led to a bunch of like different paths that you can take yeah. to like sort of understand noise in terms of like musical idiom. Like you can enter it from an ambient direction with yellow swans and Jeff Rechantou um, that guy uh, <laughs> or you could enter it through like a rock direction with the goslings and also wolf eyes yeah um, and you can enter from like a electronic direction with prurient mm-hmm. um, prurient is a very very discography that's a fucking, yeah but, but that's, like, that's a whole specific... yeah that's a whole other can of worms but yeah yeah but but like understanding noise 
in the ways that it communicates like actual musical ideas and not just seeing it as a fucking like tourist attraction to go yes. see this natural disaster. Yeah. Uh, like Purian, this, Purian is so goth. Like there's nobody else that sounds as goth as Purian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no matter ha, ha, what ha, he's doing. Have y'all, ha, have y'all heard the history of AIDS? The history it, of AIDS is a banger. It really is. Such a banger. Ugh. But, uh, but, um, the, the thing that, that like triggered my recent like just pad Jennings and rage was when I saw <laughs> an iceberg meme and it was a music genres iceberg meme <laughs> and and it was all shit that he had talked about from uh, top to bottom and uh, on the bottom was danger music wow but, and I just like I snapped what, yeah danger music this thing that was done by like thir- 30 dudes in New York City for like two weeks that's the most extreme yeah. genre of music and, wow. and like like it could more accurately be described as like a brief movement of performance art yeah it's barely a genre it's not really something like i hate that because it also kind of like subtly points towards the notion that like music that needs to be seen in a performance space is inherently more abstract and challenging which exemplifies the notion that all of these opinions and nightmare icebergs and and things are being are being are creating a giant ambient phallus that's hanging over any music that is not convenient to be listened to in the exact location of sitting at your computer and putting headphones on in your house which is also bad it had it had fucking it had industrial and metal and then industrial metal below both of those wow i love art (laughs) (laughs) It, it fucking hurts christ and and then uh their vocaloid was on there as well you know what's you know what's scarier than purian fucking ministry (laughs) that's that's a band that's way more obscure (laughs) and scary uh that's a genre that's a lot easier to tackle than like frozen niagara falls or whatever or uh whatever the fuck that three hour album is called um, he has like eight of those there's one called uh <laughs> there's one alias he has called exploring jezebel that's all about like uh sadism that's that's all about like femdom sadism stuff and one of them's like this eight cassette tape box set called penis torture chamber which i do want to listen to at some point <laughs> looks fantastic oh man i love noise i there's love so harsh cool noise. stuff so much cool stuff to find i i would be doing a service if i let more people into that genre you really would I like did you know that the w- william barnett from white house plays genshin impact i don't fucking care about white house i have <laughs> i care about white house i like when the man yell funny i have cooled on buyer's market and i don't want to talk about it yeah i why. also don't want to talk about fuck you peter soto suck my dick fuck you fuck you peter. Don't, do not do no. not I, suck yeah my peter dick. peter please don't suck my dick <laughs> <laughs> i don't want you near my dick peter <laughs> Uh, I like I like the parts of White House where the funny man does a yell. <laughs> Pablo is a record that feels like very in love with the content that it's presenting and the form in which it's presenting it. Like all of the things that brought draw attention to itself being an album, like the intermission tracks that like there are that all of the there's for the amount of intermission tracks on there, none of them really feel like they break the flow of the album in any devastating way. Like um I I don't like Sur- Silver Surfer intermission. I, I, that one, I that one, turn, that one, that one I always, tests me a little bit, but I like. I it. always have to turn the volume down because it's so like the guy's voice is so tinny. Silver Surfer. It's, it's like Silver Surfer, but the Silver Surfer is inside your ears, stabbing you. <laughs> so, because the like, the the silver is surfing into your fucking trachea. <laughs> um. But even then, like, the stuff where it's, like, the really long ride-out portion on the end of 30 hours, um, that... Oh, honestly, I am thrilled that 30 hours is part of the main track listing. It would not have worked as well as a bonus track. Um, but ha- having that long section at the end lead into No More Parties in L.A., which is something where you do really have to pay attention to the lyrics for a lot of it to get a lot out of it. Um, that's Gabe Collin. Uh, that's Gabe Collin. It's important. Gabe Collin is important. They're in love. It's it's part of that audio was included in the record because it's good audio and it's fun and it's funny to listen to, uh, and it and it feels like a very casual stop on part of a broader tour. It feels like every bit of content is important. 
And that's why I like Fade as uh, an outro for the record kind of more um, than uh, St. Pablo. Because the way that it ends, it has this like, the, it has the final verse and it has like a big climactic point. But then it has this fade out section where the elements of the track are slipped away and slipped away until you're left with just the main Mr. Fingers sample. Um, and the thing that I really love about like the last couple seconds of that track is that you can tell that there's like, uh, you can hear the chop in the sample. There's like an audible snip uh, every time that the sample loops. And it's not something where, and it's, and, and it, at the, I that, always come That to, vocal chop sam sample is like really visibly like grainy that too that like, too because it slowed down but and then and then the the i get lifted comes in and i ascend but the point um, but the point with the like that being like that is not even that there is necessarily a point to it it doesn't add anything to the record but having those things be visibly part of the record it doesn't draw away from it either it's this thing where it's like yes i am listening to this sample and it's chopped right there and it's fucking great and i love it it feels like it feels like I think the reason the, the life of Pablo, whether or not it's like my favorite album, which it might become eventually, um, it's my favorite record to talk about because it's so honest about everything that's doing, and it wants to get you involved with every um, with every step and every um, with every step of the record. Um, like I don't trust anyone who says like part two is a sound collage or whatever because it's not a sound collage; it's a bunch of cool ideas back to back bunch of cool shit together that uh ride that that uh reinforces father stretch my hands part one it's not a sound collage it's an outro and it's a really fucking good outro yeah that's that's it what i mean like, it yeah. feels like a se second part mm -hmm. and then there's an outro to that yep that's it's just it's just well put together it's just that, a... oh that's that's the other thing like a lot of, the amount of times that there's a sample of something and then uh there's also someone singing it yes that's the component of symmetry too like even track to track like famous opening with like the, the with the nina simone sample being sung and then having it be brought back in later as something that's like as as the sample itself after that song is so good oh my god it's so good <laughs> uh and then it's also reinforced by sampling an entire designer track and then letting him feature yes absolutely and it comes full circle there can I say the the meanest part on the record is dropping the beat out when during the I think me and Taylor might still have sex part. That is <laughs> easily the meanest part on the record. So rude. More so than Saint Pablo. Yeah, Life of Pablo is an incredibly solid like work within itself. It's very enthusiastic about being an album. Um, it's more. I it's an album it's exactly like it. It's more random than random it's not a mixtape it's not something that was hastily thrown together this is not like the life of pablo is not like what a bunch of disparate ideas sounds like um it, yeah, it, it's it's, not, it's it's like we gotta get spongebob back it's by joe <laughs> when, when you're i, I don't want to go too deep into that because i know you're gonna <laughs> do like a thing on that eventually but yes it is yeah. like it is like we gotta get spongebob back and um, by extension it's also like a schoenberg suite mm-hmm um it's fucking great it's just like so good the pad it's it's a it's a lot of like really small payoffs and and the uh, releases that are patterned throughout the record i that kind I of that kind of go backwards and forwards you, you described it as additive yeah and, it that, is, and yeah. that really makes sense like it feels like it's constantly moving forward through something mm -hmm. and the beginning and end point are almost like arbitrary mm -hmm. and all the little bits of detail within what we're viewing feels like we're passing by so many different thoughts and experiences i kind of am against and... that at this point because like i feel like it's not necessarily arbitrary the pieces in between it but like but like the i wouldn't say it's arbitrary necessarily but all of the pieces being together in this one grouping is more important than them being in any specific order like it's all about like the symmetrical element is not that you could like immediately graph the the record onto like a one and two piece of things and find they perfectly overlap it's the sense that it's all of these parts that were meant to go together in this order that feels like unintuitive at first and you and through the process of negotiating it is very rewarding i want to do that it's really fucking good
I don't th- like I don't think I could do that if I tried, but I want to try it. <laughs> <laughs> this is um whenever I think of art that costs like a million dollars to make, I want it to like um, an inhumane amount of money for any piece of art to cost to make. I want it to sound like the life of Pablo. The life of Pablo sounds like it cost like three hundred million dollars to make or whatever the fuck. Yeah, it's it sounds more ambitious than Dark Twisted Fantasy. Yeah, it really does. Like Dark it Twisted, sounds yeah, like, yeah. It, it feels sound, it it's, sounds like fucking Birdman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or I. <laughs> it's it's. Have you seen Birdman? I have seen Birdman. Okay, I forget most of it. It felt like an art house version of like a blockbuster movie. I kind of like Transformers. I I remember it being alright. I want to re-listen to it. It's it's like a like an Oscar bait like action spectacle movie, but it, there's no action in it. It has like <laughs> the same effect. I might like, like that. Uh. Boat Knife is an arts and culture podcast. We've been recording for two hours. Uh, we have been um, recording for two hours. Um, Pablo Pablo feels more effort, effortlessly gigantic than uh, Dark Twisted Fantasy, and I think that's why it's very exciting to me. Uh, the low, yes. in, the low impact. That, that's one that is a good way of putting it. It's very yeah. effortlessly gigantic. Yeah. And in a way that I don't think I've ever seen any album be. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to what one last uh, fun anecdote I wanted to cap off on that's kind of unrelated from anything else is um, I was uh, in a voice call with some other people and uh, I was uh, talking about Pablo as you do um, and I was like wait who's the other guy on Real Friends because none of the features are listed um, and someone informed me that it was Ty Dolla Sign a person who is uh, so well known for doing features on other people's songs and not really being recognized for it, that his most recent mixtape is called Featuring Ty Dolla Sign, which I thought was cute. <laughs> he's, he's, on, he's on a Jacob Collier track. Yeah, sounds on, about he's right. On, he's, on, he's on All I Need, and he is, to this date, the only feature that Jacob Collier has not completely wasted. I love you, Ty. I love you, Ty Dolla Sign. I don't want that yeah, to disparage he's, you, he's, Ty. You do a great so job. Good. You're really fucking good, Ty. He's so good. <sighs> uh, we gushed a lot. We did. We did. That was good. I felt like that was a good one. I I, I feel like I learned. I, I feel like I learned a lot. I feel like I developed yeah. my ideas. Um, Can I pause? Uh, I, yeah. I hold stopped. on. Wait. Hold on. I want to like. Uh, no, okay. we don't. We don't plug shit on the podcast. Fuck you. Bye. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Yeah. Oh!